optimized. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that covers our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Uh, very excited for this episode. Uh, earlier this week, we had a crack at talking about uh, the world's energy transition, but I'm glad today we've got an expert joining us to... I guess, correct our misunderstandings, go deeper on the topic and really understand the investing opportunity that's here. Absolutely. And not just any expert, but an equity mate's favorite expert. We've had a, a lot of demand for this expert to come back on the show. So it is with great excitement and an ab our absolute pleasure to welcome back Mary Manning to the show. Mary, welcome. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me back. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, and I do not lie, it's in the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of the community reach out being like, when's Mary back? So <laughs> oh, great. That's, that's very nice to hear. <laughs> so uh, we're excited for this one. If you haven't come across Mary before, firstly, go back and listen to our first episode um, where we spoke about the Asia opportunity, which was a fantastic episode. Uh, but Mary is a portfolio manager at Alfinity Investment Management. She manages the Alfinity Global Fund and Global Sustainable Fund, has plenty of experience having worked at Oak Tree Capital and Soros Funds Management in New York as well. Um, but please do go and listen to our previous episode. It was an absolute pleasure. We certainly got a lot out of it. Mm. Uh, today, we are going to be discussing the energy transition and the investment opportunity of decarbonisation. And this episode is proudly sponsored by InStyle Solar, who are one of the largest companies in Australia, solar companies in Australia, and a Clean Energy Council approved retailer. Not only is solar a clean energy solution, but there are plenty of financial benefits as well, some of which we'll touch on uh, later in the episode. So if you would like to get a solar system for yourself, InStyle Solar are offering Equity Mates community 10% off a new solar system you can book a personalized consultation at instylesolar.com slash equity mates but enough of that slash mates slash mates <laughs> instylesolar.com slash mates but enough of that let's get on to the show let's do it so mary uh, after that long run up from bryce there <laughs> i think <laughs> i think we would love to start by taking a step back and framing the conversation in what's happened over the past few decades because there's been a lot of change uh, and there's been a lot of headlines around, you know, obviously climate change, but also the need to decarbonise the electricity grid. So uh, if you can take us back, uh, maybe let's go a couple of decades. Uh, where were we and uh, where are we today? All right, that is a fantastic place to start. So about 20 years ago, the energy mix was still almost exclusively in fossil fuels. So in oil, gas and coal. And if you look at any of the charts that are out there that look at the energy mix before that, even for hundreds of years, it was all predominantly fossil fuel based. And then um, probably a decade or, or two ago, that started to change for a number of reasons. But obviously, the, um, the push towards decarbonization was one of those. And so you started to see the rise of different renewables. So in renewables, obviously, there's solar, wind, hydro. Uh, increasingly, there's different kinds of renewables like biofuel or, or other sorts of, of renewables. And right now, the mix is still about 80-20 in terms of 80 at fossil fuels and 20 in, in renewables. But as you guys know from your previous podcast, to make some of the Paris Agreement targets um, or even to make targets that are even close to that, that energy mix has to continue to change over time so that renewables take a much, much bigger slice of the pie and uh, fossil fuels take an increasingly smaller slice of the pie. Mm. So you did mention there are a number of reasons for this change, but let's start with the cost side of things. How does the cost of renewable generation compare with fossil fuels and how has this changed over the past decade? So this is one of the main things that has, has driven um, the, the rise of renewables. Uh, and it's important to point out that this is, this is relative, right? It's not just the absolute cost of renewables. It's the cost of renewables relative to what's going on in fossil fuels. So um, solar would probably be one that I would call out as, as um, the renewable that has the most reduction in, in cost over the last few years. So say from 2009 to the beginning of 2020, the cost of solar is down about 89, 90%. So that is, that is absolutely massive. When we get to the 
investment part, we can talk about why that is and what that means for companies, because that's great if you um, if you don't want to use solar energy, but if you're if you're a company um, and your your ASP is going down by that much, that can actually throw up um, problems from an investment perspective. So solar has gone down a lot, and then wind. Um, you know, onshore wind has been historically where where a lot of the wind power has come from. That cost has gone down, and now you're seeing uh, a larger push into offshore wind, and those costs are expected to come down over time. So wind and solar are the two where I would I would call out the um, significant decrease in cost. On the other side of the relative trade, um, you need to look at what's going on with fossil fuels. And this is why I think doing this episode at this time is absolutely fascinating because you have an energy crisis almost mm. in Europe and a lot of, of the Northern Hemisphere. So, I mean, if you think back to covid Remember, oil was around 20, and there was that one day when oil futures actually went negative. Yeah, and everyone yeah. was thinking, oh well, what, is that? what does that even mean? <laughs> um, and so if, if someone had told you, you know, fast forward a year, 18 months, and oil's going to be at 80, uh, I don't think anyone would have anticipated that. And natural gas prices are, have also um, had a huge leap higher. And so when you look at that relative trade that, you know, renewables costs are still going down and that you've seen this sort of resurgence for a number of reasons, both on the demand and supply side, um, the relative attractiveness of renewables is quite strong right now. The other thing that I will highlight is that um, there's no OPEC in renewables. So um, on the on the oil side, you know, since many, many decades, you've had a big international body where there's lots of participants and they, they have mechanisms to sort of control the oil price. And there's no, um, you know, analogy or, or similarity in terms of renewable um, so that that also has a, has a big impact sort of on the relative pricing of, of uh, renewables versus fossil fuels. Mm. Solar generators don't get any ideas. We don't need a renewable OPEC. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that wasn't a suggestion. That was just a comment. <laughs> so on the point of it's, it's all about relative cost, uh, the cost of putting on uh, like a megawatt of solar or wind compared to putting on a megawatt of coal or gas uh, is one now absolutely cheaper than the other or is it you know still dependent on where it is and how they're building it and stuff like that no so absolutely cheaper the interesting thing that you brought up coal is that the cost of coal has been relatively stable through all this that's one you know it's not in the oil and gas bucket and it's uh, not in the renewables bucket so it's been relatively stable so if you look at a chart of the the pricing like solar and wind have gone down and coal has gone flat and the other ones are sort of up and down with the, the trend um, generally down so yeah in terms of adding additional capacity um, actually the another thing that I should add is that we're talking about global here and within different countries um, there can be a, a huge differential between the cost of, of different renewables and um, and of fossil fuels. So one of the reasons that there is this crisis in, in Europe right now is because, um, you know, you had very little wind in the North Sea during the summertime and you had a drought in large parts of Europe. So hydro like mm -hmm. literally <laughs> dried up and, um, you know, wind wasn't wasn't producing as much into the grid as it is it had historically. And then natural gas, which is by some seen as a, as a sort of transition fuel. There were issues with the natural gas supply coming out of, of Russia. So all of a sudden you have, you know, and, and nuclear is very, very hotly debated in, in mm. Europe about whether it's uh, renewable and whether it's good and whether it's bad and, and a lot of things. So you had sort of that, that perfect storm um, that resulted in a very specific issue in Europe and you're not seeing that in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You are seeing that a little bit in China. It's just something we can talk about later. China obviously has a 2060 net zero commitment um, and to get there they have to you know work backwards and have very specific interim targets and right now you're seeing a sort of power crisis in China also because even those very near-term targets I mean companies just can't make them so they're, they're trying to make the, the targets by shutting down, which is obviously not good for the overall economy. So um, yeah, in general, renewables cost is going down uh, and is, is getting cheaper than a lot of the traditional fossil fuels, but it does differ around the world depending on what country you're talking about. Yeah. Well, speaking of targets, um, a, a second driver for this transition that we're seeing is obviously the commitments from a lot of governments from around the world. You know, Biden's come out to say 100% carbon free by, would carbon free generation by 2035. Um, I guess the question is, how are these commitments actually translating into policy or action? And are they? Yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> well, that, that is also a good question. I think um, it's important to highlight that there, there's, again, a very wide range around the world. And we sort of divide it up into, um, there's net zero in law, 
there's net zero in policy, there's net zero that are like under construction, and then there's countries that are like, we don't care, we're, <laughs> we're not saying yeah. anything <laughs> about this at all. <laughs> and so, right, yeah. um, you know, the interesting thing is if you look at like um, countries like France, so they have a net zero uh, 2050 target, and that's actually in law. And then you have a lot of other European countries or, you know, Canada, um, Jer uh, Japan that have net zero uh, 2050 targets that are in policy and then you have big countries like Russia and India who are massive economies with massive populations and are very fast growing and they have no net zero target at all so there's a very wide range out there I think you, you started the question by talking about Biden um, as you would know the the original initial Paris agreements were signed in 2015 mm -hmm. and then Trump came in and pulled America out and that sort of lost a lot of momentum so any kind country that wasn't committed um, that Trump kind of gave them an excuse to <laughs> not not get committed and then um, near the end of Trump administration in uh, 2020 China actually came out with the 2060 net zero and that is an absolutely huge thing you, you know we've talked about China extensively before in another context but to have China is by far the biggest emitter globally so to have them on board is, is a very strong signal and China is also a developing country and so a lot of the commentary around just transition and can you have de developed countries and developing countries having to have net zero targets at the same time China really dealt with a lot of that all at once. So then um, obviously Biden became president and he uh, re-ratified or rejoined the uh, Paris agreements and then you've seen a lot of, of more policies coming from there. Um, Europe, as you know, is far, far ahead, mm -hmm. way far ahead. So, um, you know, if you have the European Green Deal and you have that translating into Fit for 55 sort of um, policy, it's not legislation yet, but like policy initiatives, there is a lot going on in Europe and I think that Europe will continue to be a global leader. Um, the thing is, like I mentioned before, is is what happens to the, the laggards, um, Russia, India, and will China be able to make that 2060 target? These are <laughs> these are very long term um, things. And I don't think anyone there, there's certainly a commitment there. But I spend a lot of time looking at the, the near term targets. So the interim targets for 2030, this goes for both governments and for uh, corporates, because 2030 is not that far away. No, no, no. And, um, you know, it, it, when people first started talking about it, it was it was long away. But uh, f now for um, like if you're a CEO, you could still be the CEO in 2030. So you better be really careful about what you're saying about your company's net zero targets, because you may still be around <laughs> when you have to deliver on those. And the same for, for governments. If you're a president or a prime minister, and you commit your country to something in 2030, that could be an election issue for you if you don't deliver. So, um, yeah, I guess to sum up, there there's a wide range of what's going on in, in terms of, of policy. I think it's important to focus on both the interim targets and then the longer term goal for 2050. Mm. So we've mentioned cost uh, and we've mentioned government policy. Are there any other key drivers that should, we should be aware of when we're thinking about this transition? Yes, I think that the collaboration between governments and corporates is absolutely amazing. Um, it, it is a, a rare example. COVID is maybe another example of where, you know, a lot of the world is, is pulling together and different stakeholders are pulling together, all working towards one goal. So I'll give you some examples from our portfolio at Alfinity. And um, just to be clear, I'm one of a number of portfolio managers that manage the fund. So it's, it's not just me, but we do have the Global Fund and we have the Global Sustainable Fund. And, um, you know, in the, the Global sustainable fund, we have eight of the top 10 positions have a carbon target. Three of them are already carbon neutral. And um, if you are, are in a meeting with, with uh, investor relations or with management, um, it's rare for a lot of these big global companies to not have any carbon policy at all. And even five years ago, that was that was not the case. And so um, I think it's really important that corporates are, are on board. Investors are, are um asking this of corporates like what is your what is your carbon policy what is your net zero policy what what are your interim targets um we, we have a whole sort of 10 point checklist that you can go through with companies to make sure that they're on board so i think that's that's something that you need to be aware of is that it's not just governments driving it but it's it's a collaboration between governments and um, corporates and civil society and academia and there's just a lot of different stakeholders on board that makes me more um confident or enthusiastic that there's uh, you know, these targets can actually be met mm -hmm. because there is a lot of momentum behind it. So one one thing that Bryce and I noticed when we were looking and listening to the latest uh, reporting season was the amount of Australian companies that were talking about carbon neutral targets or they were already carbon neutral. It was definitely a big theme coming out of reporting season, which was great to see. Um I guess my question is when a company achieves carbon neutrality and, you know, 
that can be done through buying carbon offsets. Mm-hmm. So if the company can afford to, they can do it pretty quickly. As a sustainable fund manager, what what are you looking for next? Like, is there something, once a company's carbon neutral, what's sort of the next milestone that uh, you're they're trying to hit or you want to see them hit? Is there anything after that? So I think before you get to what's after that, you need to get to what's before that. Okay. Because, <laughs> um, because so, so for the sustainability uh, fund at Alfinity, we have a charter. It's a sustainability charter and it lays out very, very clearly what kind of companies we can invest in and what kind of companies we can't. And fossil fuels is is a can't. Yeah. So we cannot invest in fossil fuels. So a lot of the, co- and then, um, you know, on the flip side of that, you have a lot of the biggest companies in global markets, um, Google, Apple, Microsoft, you know, Netflix, the, the classic sort of fang, asset light um, companies that have very impressive and very uh, aggressive carbon neutrality targets. And they, um, I think they're sort of leading the world in, in where you can go. So when you're running a sustainability fund that is sort of screening out or is not investing in some of those I'll call them bad. I'm using a quotation <laughs> here. Bad companies um, that need a very specific plan to change their whole energy mix and to change their emissions. We're generally not invested in those those companies uh, anyway. So when you're in asset light, already you know good companies, the discussion is 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 very different. So a lot of the discussions that that we have with companies are. First of all, in terms of understanding the targets and understanding um, those interim targets, like I've said before, because that's very critical. And then you raised a great point in terms of using offsets. So not all carbon neutrality is, is created equally. There, there needs to be discussion and a lot of analysis in terms of how you're getting to, to carbon neutral. And then um, I guess while we're not in any sort of like bad or, or dirty companies, um, there is autos, which is a sector where you can have the discussion. So like Daimler would be an example. Mm-hmm. So they have a whole fleet or like a installed base, if you will, of ICE cars, but they're moving very aggressively towards EVs. So having a discussion of how do those two things off each set offset each other and then what does the company look like going forward to your initial question (laughs) um what does the company look like um moving forward so i think um for for a lot of companies uh you're not at the stage yet google might be one example where they're carbon neutral and sort of that's in the past and and what's going forward most of the discussion with with companies is still how are you going to get to carbon neutrality and what is the quality of that trajectory Mm -hmm. um you know it's it's very risky if they're just buying offsets and very low quality offsets because that's not fixing the under not underlying problem Mm. so mary when when you're looking forward 2030 2050 do you can do you expect the the momentum that we've seen over the last decade to sort of continue and where do you and and our affinity sort of think the world's energy is going to be coming from so 2030 is, as we mentioned before, pretty close. And I would expect that tra- the trajectory towards more renewables in the sort of global energy pie um, continues the way it, it is going, if not accelerating quite significantly. So we were talking before about how the, the UN conference called COP26 is coming up in Glasgow. That's at the end of October, beginning of November. Uh, you know, we're expecting quite significant policy pronouncements. I don't know whether these <laughs> these are going to actually turn into actual legislation, but certainly policy pronouncements and commitment to to more decarbonization to come out of out of that. So there's a lot of momentum and I think that's accelerating. I think 2050, this is my personal view, this is not an Alfinity view, but uh, as you know, I, I have a PhD in economics and um, as part of my PhD thesis, I spent a lot of time like reading about Thomas Malthus because um, I was looking at economic development. He's obviously a famous um, economist and demographer from the 18th century and his his theory was ended up being totally wrong, right? Because he said that population grows exponentially and the words food production grows linearly Mm. and you're going to run into a big problem and everyone's going to starve at some point. And he was wrong because of technology. He, He just... (laughs) didn't <laughs> didn't think about fertilizer. He didn't think about changing the technology of, of agriculture, and he totally missed the industrial revolution part of it, which was a big thing to, <laughs> to miss. With all due respect to Thomas Malthus, that was a big thing to miss. But I sort of feel like on a 2050 view, which is which is unlike 2030, it's decently far away. That what things we don't I don't know what things are going to look like in 2050. I think that there are technologies out there that we haven't even thought of, and you know we we can talk about Tesla later on. But Tesla is, is a stock that I absolutely love, and if you go back. 30 years from now, nobody was thinking Tesla is going to be a massive solution to the, or, or EVs, or these, this is going to be a big solution to the energy um, transition and to, to decarbonization. So 2050, certainly renewables will, ha- will continue to have a bigger slice of the pie, but I think there's, 
there's um, unknown unknowns out there that are going to um, sort of change things from a technological perspective that we haven't thought about. And that's actually really exciting from an investment yeah, perspective yeah. because there may be little nascent ideas right now that are, are not investable, but as those get bigger and as you can get more visibility on where those are going, I think those are going to be um, pretty exciting ideas. Yeah. So Mary, let's chat about the investment opportunity. Uh, as an investor, how do you approach mm -hmm. investing in such big change in what is now this world's energy transition? So I think there's two ways to approach it. And then I'll tell you what the sort of Alfinity way is. So you can take a top down approach and you can say, okay, I know there's this very big thematic that's going to happen. And what are the sub thematics there? And then what are the, um, you know, stocks that sort of fall out of that and then invest in that stock. Um, when China came out with the China 2060 net zero policy, I, I was super excited, like <laughs> sleepless nights. I was so excited about this. So, um, I, I tried to take the top-down approach. And so I divided the, the China net zero into different categories. There's going to be renewables are going to be a beneficiary, electric vehicles are, and electrification is going to be a beneficiary. There's going to be the EV supply chain. And then there's other, whether it's you know hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or, or sort of other ideas. And so um, you know each of the analysts on my team took took one of these buckets and we hired a special summer intern to do extra work on this. And we're like, we're going to come up with a whole raft of ideas from this top, top down approach. And six months later, we had very, very few ideas. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, I know it, it was a bit depressing. <laughs> um, and and the, the, <laughs> yes, exactly. It just did a 180. Um, and the reason was because at a thematic level, this can sound absolutely amazing. And then when you drill down for, to a company specific level, um, there, there are issues with, with a number of, of renewable companies. So this is specifically with China. And this was in my, my uh, old role. Um, like a lot of the solar supply chain um, is, is based in China and it gets their production of polysilicon from Xinjiang and that has a lot of ESG issues. So um, for the fund that I was working at at the time, um, you know, that, that was out. So you had a big part of, of one of the most attractive uh, stories that, that was sort of off. Uh, in terms of, of wind, um, you know, there, there are some very good wind companies out there, but there are also sometimes the economics of wind because these are very big investments mm -hmm. um, and it's very long dated investments um, that they, they didn't stack up. And so where we sort of landed on the China analysis was that EVs and EV supply chain are a very, very attractive way to play the um, the the energy transition. The Alfinity way, Alfinity is very focused on, on bottom up. Um, stock picking and specifically looking at earnings leadership for stocks. And so, um, again, uh, interestingly, whether you take a top down approach or a bottom up approach, you're kind of getting to the same answer. So if there's any advice that I could give to your listeners, it would be that um, make sure you do the investment case, because if you just do the thematic case and you get really excited, you can get in some stocks that turn out to be absolute dogs. Yeah. So um, be excited about the thematic because it's definitely worth being thematic, uh, excited about. But then do the work. So at Alfinity, looking for earnings leadership, um, you know, some of the stocks that we've identified, some of the wind stocks in, in Europe are quite interesting on a, on a longer term basis. But right now, as you would well know, there's a lot of supply chain issues in the world. And for some of these big wind turbines, they're not... Um, you know, this is an Amazon or, or Nike where you just charter a plane and stick the shoes on the plane and, and bypass all that. Like if you have supply chain issues for some of these big wind turbines, that can be quite extensive. So um, a lot of those stocks are, are like wind in particular in Europe. They're long term winners, but they're just not investable right now. So in terms of other winners, um, kind of the same conclusion that I came to with China, uh, electric vehicles and the whole electrification sub thematic, I think is is very uh, attractive. And part of the reason is because companies like Tesla, they, they're just revolutionizing the whole auto industry. And so it's not um, sort of like a traditional energy company where you they may be doing some renewables, but they still have that legacy fossil fuel business or like Daimler, like I mentioned before, they have the, the bad cars and the good cars and they <laughs> are sort of canceling each other out. Um, if you can find um, sort of EVs or EV supply chain companies that are that are just focused on this, that, that's a very um, good place to, to be. Mm. I guess the other thing for, for your listeners, which I'll highlight is, is very, very simple analysis, like Porter's Five Forces, kind of classic business school, MBA sort of stuff. Because the issue in, in some of these renewable businesses, which makes them not great investments, is that they either have very low barriers to entry. Solar might be an example there. And so the, the product just gets completely commoditized. And that's why you've seen the, the you know, fall off in prices. And um, yeah, that's great if you're a consumer. That's not great if you're a company and, and it's, it's a volume times ASP 
sort of game. So looking at those forces, like what are the competitors, what are the uh, barriers to entry, what, what are the bargaining power suppliers, that's really important analysis to do when you're looking at renewables uh, from an industry perspective. So to, to answer your question, you can look at it top down, you can look at it from bottom up. Some people do both. Alfinity is very focused on earnings leadership from the bottom up. And we have a, sort of a more, um, right now anyways, there's not a lot of earning, earnings leadership in some of the renewables. Yeah, right. mm. So you've mentioned a number of categories of investment there, shall we say, EVs, EV supply chain, uh, wind generation, solar generation, solar components. Are, th are there any other sort of major categories that we should be aware of um, in, in the energy transition space? Yeah, so there's renewables, EVs, EV supply chain. And then one thing which... Um, I almost hesitate to bring up because there's there's so few stock ideas to point to, but this is maybe one of those those you know nascent ideas yeah. that we should keep an eye on. If you look at the agenda for COP26, uh, one of it is actually part of it is based on on biodiversity and looking at nature based solutions to um, a lot of the environmental issues in the world. So under sort of a, a N NBS or nature based solutions, you know biofuels is something that's really interesting. Um, I know you guys uh, this is not under nature based solutions, but um, you guys have done a podcast on hydrogen. Mm -hmm. That that could have a lot of, you know, hydrogen. I, I read an article recently that it's like the Swiss Army knife of decarbonization yeah, yeah. because it um, it has so many uses. And I think that, that's a really good headline. It's it's true. So how that comes out in corporate earnings or, or company earnings, it's still yet to be seen. But that's something I'd, I'd keep an eye on. Um, and then energy efficiency is actually a totally different sector, which this is maybe why I didn't find very many ideas in China because I, I didn't think I wasn't thinking about the energy efficiency aspect. But if you look at a pie chart of like energy uses and, and emitters by sector in the world, obviously you have electricity and heat and then you have transportation, which is why EVs is, is so important. And then if you have like industry and, and um, you know, building efficiency, that is a really um, clear pathway that the world needs to go mm. on to, to make it to, to the Paris agreements. So, um, you know, there are some building materials companies, um, different like construction companies that are learning, leaning towards more green materials. There's probably some, some um, optionality within there. And then the last thing I'll mention is green tech. So as you guys know, I love tech. It's, it's, my, it's, my, favorite, it's my favorite sector. So I can possibly get tech in somewhere I'd, I'd like to do it. But um, a company we can talk about later is, is Enphase. It's a company that makes microinverters for solar panels. So it's not the actual panels. It's a, it's a high IP um, uh, you know, inverter that gets stuck on the panels and that does the energy efficiency uh, for how the, the solar electricity actually goes onto the grid. So some of these more green tech, that's just one example, green tech ideas um, that either facilitate or enable the transition to decarbonization. I think there's going to be some really interesting ideas there. So Mary, there are a number of different ways to invest in, in this theme um, that you've just touched on there. And we'd love to get specific and hear about a couple of ideas that uh, are on your watch list at the moment. Um, so uh, let, let's move to that. We asked you uh, to come with uh, a couple of stocks that you could tell us about, uh, why, why you think they're interesting uh, and fit in this theme, and then you know, what the company might look like in the years ahead. Uh, I believe one of them is Tesla. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when you asked me for three stocks in renewables, and off the top of my head, the first three, none of them were renewables. They were actually three stocks that are all beneficiaries of decarbonization, but none of them are renewables. So I guess that would be my first point to your, your listeners is how, take a broad view mm. of decarbonization beneficiaries, because it's not just going to be renewables. It's going to be across many, many different sectors. So I have picked one that's a consumer discretionary, uh, one that's a technology stock, and then one that's actually um, considered a, a renewable. Okay. Well, why don't you give us the three names yep. and then we'll go one by one. Okay. Tesla, yep. Enphase, and Vestas. Okay. Nice. Great. So let's start with Testa, Tesla let's maybe. Start with Tesla. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, such a, it's such a lightning rod stock. And mm -hmm. what I found in a lot of investor meetings is that people love it or hate it. Yeah. Everybody has an opinion of it. And very, there's very few people that are in the in the middle. Yeah. So um, that's fine. It's, it's all good for debate. So I guess the reasons that, that I like Tesla is, as we discussed before, if you look at a, a pie chart of uh, you know emitters by sector, transportation is a very, very big slice of that pie. And so you're not going to make it to any of the interim or the longer term targets without um, a solution in the transportation industry. And unlike some of the other slices of the pie, there is a solution that's actually already available in transportation. And so it's it's not pie in the sky and nascent idea. Like these are actually, you know, the transition to EVs is already significantly underway. So I guess that that's one thing. Um, the second thing is 
if you look at market share of EVs in the world right now, it's still under 5%. So it's mid single, like low single digit. Mm. And then if you look at what uh, is going to be going forward, I mean, that's going to be certain companies are already saying that by 2030, 2035, 100% of their new vehicles are going to be um, EVs. So from Tesla's perspective, the runway for growth when you have the entire world um, transitioning to EVs, not to mention the opportunities for growth in countries that are going to leapfrog. So, you know, we've talked about India extensively before, but, you know, car penetration in India is extremely low. And what happens if EVs roll out in India and, and people just skip that whole ICE stage of development and you mm. go right from nothing to uh, electric scooter to an electric vehicle the the runway for tesla in terms of growth is is really really uh exciting i guess the second thing which people don't appreciate about tesla is that it's not just a car company so tesla um, is now really into solar so that's going to be that's a, a big part of their business that's growing very fast and they have parts of their business that are both forward and backward integrated which facilitate decarbonization so they're backwardly integrating into their own batteries and the battery supply chain is is, and the cost of batteries is absolutely critical to the um, rollout of evs globally and then they're obviously have the supercharger stations um as you know on the the flip side um you know, everybody wants an EV, but you need to make sure you have enough charging stations. Otherwise, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't work out very well. So the fact that that Tesla it's not end to end, but it's certainly um, more integrated than than traditional OEM auto companies. I think that's a big opportunity. One thing about Tesla, which has very little to do with decarbonization, but is an important part of the story, is their um, assisted driving, and um, the the pushback on Tesla is always about valuation. Like, yeah. oh my goodness, it's already an $800 <laughs> billion dollar company and they hardly sell any cars and the market cap per car is ridiculous. And I mean, you know the you know the, yeah, the pushback. It's more than the rest of the whole car industry combined in yes. terms of market cap, yeah. <laughs> yes, so, so the way that you can justify or even you know, get upside for Tesla from here is, is on the technology angle and that their, their technology in terms of assisted driving, um, if that, you know, from a valuation perspective, that shouldn't be valued at the same uh, multiple as a car company. That should be valued at a, the, a multiple of a software company. Mm. And software companies, as you know, trade right now they're trading at 30 times price to sales. So if you do a, a sum of the parts of, of Tesla and you have the, the auto business and then you have the sort of tech business and then you have the solar business and then you have the ancillary services like insurance, you can certainly justify uh, this stock price, if not um, get more upside. So those are some of the reasons why why I really like Tesla. And I guess the, the other thing is that... Um, Again, I hesitate to bring this up because he's so controversial, but <laughs> Elon Musk is is a visionary. He took yeah. a, a sleepy, sleepy old industry that hadn't really changed mm. since the first, you know, Model Ford and completely revolutionized it in a very short period of time and did it with his own manufacturing. Yeah. So if you listen to the last quarterly call, he's just they've just um, rolled out the Gigafactory in Texas and the Gigafactory in Berlin is also starting. And he's talking about how hard it is to manufacture cars. So the fact that they've gone from like, idea level of, of electric cars to actual manufacturing to you know integrated business model it's actually quite impressive yeah there's a quote that bill gates gave uh about elon musk back in the day that was like you wouldn't mistake him for steve jobs and it was seen as an insult because you know gates obviously thought so high of jobs compared to musk but i reckon it's now the other way around like what musk has done yeah. in you know space and electric vehicles like all these really hard capital intensive businesses yeah is just unbelievable. Yeah, it yeah. is. And one of your questions was, you know, what is the stock going to look like in 2050? So 2030, it's going to be a lot, even though it's already 800 billion market cap, it's going to be a lot bigger by uh, by 2030. But 2050, I don't know, because I was thinking, well, maybe Musk will be living on Mars. And <laughs> there's going to be no, sure. they're not going to have a CEO. I, I don't know. But um, 2050 for a company like Tesla that has a visionary leader, it's, it's anybody's bet. So um, again, Alfinity looks at earnings leadership. And oh, that's the other really interesting thing about Tesla right now. Auto companies around the world are, have, are in a world of pain about, about supply chain shortages. Mm. And Tesla, somehow, they just came out, um, not la- last weekend, with um, their production numbers and their deliveries, and they are very good. And so Tesla, because of that backward integration, because of that tech focus, um, they are actually doing a lot better than other auto companies in the immediate term. So from the Alfinity process, a lot of auto companies are going to miss earnings this coming quarter like, by quite a lot, and Tesla looks like it's, it's going to do well. So yeah, it's a stock yeah, that I wow. like. Just on the traditional automaker piece, if you know if they're not keeping up with the transition themselves, they're likely to 
be gone in you know ten years time. How, how do you think about that from a competitive landscape? It's is it like it feels like you think Tesla are going to continue to be the winner in this space. Um, yeah, just interested in how you think about that dynamic. Well, a lot of the Euro- European auto companies are leaning forward on this, mm-hmm. and they, they realize that this is an ex- existential risk. If you don't get on the board with, with EVs, you're right, you're not going to exist in, in a few years. And so Daimler, I mean, I, I said sort of before, they have the, the old business and the new business. Um, they are leaning forward but quite strongly in, in terms of um, the transition towards uh, electric vehicles. So the, the tricky thing from an investor perspective is not whether they're doing it, but how do you value that in one company where you have a legacy business and a new business? It's much harder. And so a lot of these OEMs, you know, they, they trade at you know, seven, eight times PE, and you have Tesla at 100 plus. And how, how is that... <laughs> I mean, how, how do you reconcile that? Yeah. And I think that that's what investors are really struggle with because it's, I mean, on, a, on the surface, that doesn't make sense. But to me, what that is saying is that people just want pure exposure and they're more comfortable paying more for that pure exposure than trying to pay for some sort of hybrid um which is what you're getting in a lot of the the traditional OEMs. Um, in terms of Tesla, I, th- I mean, they're not. There's. It's not like there's no risks investing in the, in the stock. There are <laughs> certainly a lot of risks investing in the stock, but the the um, return potential return outweighs the risks in my view. I think one of the risks is that the Chinese EV companies um, are taking a lot of share, and China. We talked about before. You know, they're trying to get to net zero by 2060, and they're still developing, and EVs is a huge part of that. So whether those companies get subsidized by the government or whether they kick Tesla out of China or whether they you know, shut down Gigafactory Shanghai or I don't know, but there's risks in, in terms of market share that the Chinese, um, and not, not unlike what you've seen in, in mobile phones, so that they figure out how to do a much cheaper EV yeah. sooner than Tesla does, and that they go, you know, like if you look at, at Xiaomi and Oppo and Vivo, they went into emerging markets way before, you know, Apple and even Samsung. So whether there's an analogy there with with EVs and that Tesla loses out market share in, in some of the developed markets because Teslas are still too expensive, I think that's certainly a risk to market share also. Mm, yeah, I was going to ask about Neo because that that gets a lot of buzz uh, in like the retail investor community generally. There's another competitor to Tesla that is uh, trying to get an $80 billion valuation with zero revenue, and yep. that's, uh, that's Rivian. Yep. Uh, any thoughts on that company? Yes. So, okay, if you want to feel good about the Tesla valuation, you just need to look <laughs> yeah. at the peers. <laughs> because on one hand, you're saying, am I paying 100 times plus PE for, for a stock? Um, but you know what? It has E. So, which is way better than everybody else. <laughs> so um, I, I don't have, I mean, some of these valuations are, are just pie in the sky. Yeah. And they, I, I, I mean, Alfinity, that, that is not the style of Alfinity. <laughs> we are looking for companies that have earnings leadership and that are high quality and are, that are at a, a reasonable valuation, a valuation that you can justify. And so a lot of those, you know, those stocks like Rivian and um, even the other two uh um, you know, Xiaopeng in, in China, the, the unprofitable EVs, like those are just off the table from an investment perspective for me because you, you don't really know what yeah. you're buying. So, yeah, if you want to feel good about Tesla, it's, <laughs> it's rel- relative valuation that works every time. Mary, let's move on to the second stock, which is Enphase. For those of our community who haven't heard it before, are you able to give us a bit of a, uh, a brief on what they do and why, why you like them in this space? Yeah, so Enphase is a uh, US-based company, and it is part of the solar sort of ecosystem, but it's actually in the technology sector space. And as I was mentioning before, I think that the technological solutions to decarbonization are a very good place to look for for good ideas. Um, So in in the solar industry, as as you know, you know, because a lot of these companies were subsidized uh, initially, and then the price of solar went down a lot. The the economics for the actual solar companies are not fantastic uh, because you have a commoditized product and then you ha- were highly subsidized, which made profitability look higher. And then when those subsidies have been removed or if they get removed in the future, the, the returns on the business just don't look that attractive. But we all know that at a top line, that, that solar penetration is growing really, really strongly. So how do you, how do you get involved in that? And Enphase, and there's another company in America called Solar Edge, um, which does something slightly similar. So they they have the IP, which is the it's they're called micro inverters. So say you have all these solar panels on your house, and you have two options. You can have um, you know all the electricity going into one inverter, which then max tries to maximize the um, energy that's coming from solar and feeds into the grid. But what Enphase does is they have micro inverters. So they stick a little inverter on every panel, and they're 
theory, and, and I agree with it, is that you can there, you get much better efficiency by having those microinverters on each panel, because then if one panel is in shade, that's fine. There's nothing coming from that panel, but you don't you know sort of screw up the feed from, um, from the entire set of panels. So they have microinverters, and um, the reason I like it from a stock perspective is that it's a duopoly market in America. There's only SolarEdge and Enphase. So unlike solar, where you have all these players globally, and you have really inexpensive Chinese players that are just undercutting the price of polysilicon and solar panels all the time. Um, this is a duopoly market and they do have some pricing power and they have um, regulatory um, standards that are behind their technology. So I actually forget what, what it's called, but it means that you need to have one switch that can turn off all the, the solar on from your solar panels. So in case oh. there's a problem, you don't want them to catch fire or anything like that. And that, that's actually regulated in America. And so there's only, that's, that's part of the reason why it's a duopoly. So if you take the fact that, and as a result of that, they can maintain margins. It's not that they're, you know, constantly getting undercut. So if you take a, a um, a sector that's growing at you know 20 30 percent a year and that can have at least flat margins if not some um, margin expansion then you're getting 20 30 percent um, you know growth going forward and um, you know the stock's trading at around 70 times PE which is high but that's not that high on a peg basis and it's not high given the you know penetration that they can have going forward so that's one stock um, that that I really like that sort of plays in the technological aspect of, of transition to to net zero yeah, nice. mm, I think that's fascinating uh, and a really good insight into how you found a business that is in, in, in this growing space, but is like servicing the industry and so is can be like a price maker rather than a price taker. Um, fascinating company. We are running short on time, so we'll move to the third one and that is Vest, Vestas. Vestas, yep. yeah. Uh, I've had a problem with pronouncing companies recently. <laughs> uh, based in uh, Denmark, I yes. believe. Uh, so for people who haven't heard about the company, can you tell us about it and why you like it? Yeah, so as we discussed before, you know, wind is needs to be part of the, the solution to, to decarbonization. And Vestas um, is a manufacturer of wind turbines. So if any of you have, have been up close with a world <laughs> with a, a wind turbine, they're absolutely massive. massive yeah. And um, Vestas, historically, a lot of the wind has been onshore, and now you're starting to see a big shift towards offshore. And, and for a number of uh, sort of geological or you know the weather related reasons the amount of wind offshore and the consistency of the wind offshore is, is a big benefit for for wind um, powered generation and so um, yeah Vestas makes the wind turbines and um, unlike solar where there are no barriers to entry they're actually quite significant barriers to entry uh, in wind turbines just because it's such a capital intensive um, product and you can't just you know wake up one day and decide you're going to be a wind turbine manufacturer so in the world it's it's Vestas GE and Siemens Gamesa and those are kind of the three big players and within that Vestas is is the highest quality and at Alfinity we're always looking for quality stocks so it's a stock that we held in the um sustainable portfolio before and have taken it out right now because of some of the supply chain issues that I, I mentioned before. It's just very, very difficult for these uh, companies to actually get the, you know, to solve the supply chain um, issue right now. Um, but it's certainly a stock that we like in the longer term and we'll, we'll probably go back into the portfolio at some time in the future. Fascinating. I guess for people uh, who are hearing that, you know, on the solar side, China's undercutting, it, it sounds quite easy to make a solar panel, but wind turbines are incredibly difficult to make. What? Why Why is that different? Well, I think, I mean, for one, it has to do just with the, the size. Um, and the second, I think, has to do with the, the onshore and offshore and the, the sort of end consumer or the, the end market so to speak so you can't just again you can't just wake up one day and decide you're going to build a huge offshore wind farm yeah, <laughs> there yeah, are yeah. there are significant <laughs> um, regulatory approvals that need to go through and there's there's a few number of players that will get you know given the license and given the regulatory approval to do that um, whereas solar um, you know there's solar panels are, are easy to come by and mm. you can you know so I think it's, it's that sort of um, that makes the, the main difference between between solar solar and wind. Yeah, okay. Yep. It's fascinating. Uh, Mary, we are almost out of time, but there's a lot of interest in nuclear in the uh, equity mates community. So I feel like uh, we've got to ask one question just to get your views generally on where nuclear fits into this whole transition and uh, the energy mix, both Australia and uh, around the world. 
Yeah, so this is another um, very debated topic. So I had a call actually with a European bank um, earlier this week, me and some of my colleagues, and he was saying, we were asking them sort of about their, their green credentials and do you lend to nuclear? Is this good or bad? And he was saying, we depending on which country in Europe we're lending to, there are totally different views. Some people are like, great, nuclear is, is, is fantastic. And other countries are like, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So my, this is my personal view. This is not an affinity view or... or um, personally, I, I think that nuclear is, is not going to be a huge part of the, the energy solution. And maybe it's because I was living in Asia during the Fukushima um, issue in Japan, and you had, you had people walking around with umbrellas because they didn't want you know, the nuclear like, rain to fall on them. And wow. you know, the, the, the risk-reward of nuclear... Um, you know, that, that long-tail risk that you have a nuclear disaster um, from, a, from an ESG perspective and from a sort of human welfare perspective, that, that tail risk is quite significant. So my personal view is, is like, I don't look at nuclear yeah. um, as, as an option. Um, as I said, other people in other countries uh, feel differently, but I, I, I think that biofuels and some of those other um, nascent areas are, are probably going to be more of a solution than nuclear just because it's so controversial. Mm. Nice. Well, Mary, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Equity Mates again for the second time. Uh, you've really helped us to step through what is going on with the world's energy transition, help us understand it, but also talk more importantly about the exciting investment opportunities. So thank you very much. If anyone would like in more info on what you're doing or Alfinity, what would be the best place? Yeah, so if you go to the Alfinity uh, website, we actually have multiple sustainable funds. One is a domestic sustainable fund. Um, so actually, um, Stefan, Andrea and Bruce Smith, who are the portfolio managers for that. Um, I know you had some questions about Australia. They're a much better place to answer <laughs> specific Australia questions than me. And then myself and Jeff Thompson are two of the co-leads for the sustainable fund you can find a lot of information on our website or if you just want to um, connect with me um, feel free to um, contact me on LinkedIn and happy to chat. Awesome well uh, we hope by the end of this episode that we've been able to help you understand uh, more about what's going on with the world's energy transition a little more as we discussed there are plenty of benefits and this episode was proudly sponsored by InStyle Solar a clean energy council approved retailer with over 20,000 installations to date not only is solar a clean energy solution, but you can consider it an investment opportunity. On average, InStyle Solar customers get a 20% return every year over 25 years from their solar system. So own, don't rent your power with $0 deposit and zero interest finance options. You can now pay for your system instead of paying a power bill. Head to instylesolar.com slash mates to get 10% off a new solar system with InStyle Solar. Mary, it's been an absolute pleasure. As always, we appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to catching up again. Yeah, thanks so much. Look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.